Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm going to have Lisa give a brief introduction on our partner for today's panel, which is A4. So take it away, Lisa. Thank you so much, Mia. Um, Lisa Gold, I'm the executive director of the Asian American Arts Alliance, or A4. And um, for those of you who need a um, disability check, I am a middle-aged HAPA woman with my hair pulled up in a bun. I'm wearing a red blouse. And I am speaking to you today from uh, the unceded land of the Lenape people. Um, I want to thank The Color of Music for the invitation to be here tonight and I also, you know, for all of the great work that you're doing to make the creative industries, specifically the music industry, um, more accessible to people of color. So just um, briefly about A4, we are a 37-year-old Brooklyn-based nonprofit and we're dedicated to ensuring greater representation, equity, and opportunities for Asian American artists and arts administrators and arts organizations, as well as providing a, a critical voice for the community. Um, and we are actually the only service organization in the country that's dedicated to the professional development of Asian American artists across all, all excuse me, across all disciplines. Um, so we offer lots of different events that provide opportunities to build their professional networks or to learn skills, um, things from like learning how to do your taxes to improving your YouTube site. Um, and then we also just have events for people to come together as a community to discuss issues around um, Asian American identity. And so we have a lot of talks and we call them conversations. So um, we have two really great programs coming up that I wanna just drop real quickly. Um, one is a professional development event called Table Dish, where we invite professionals from different industries to kind of dish out insider information about their careers and they um, help you build your network and offer tips on how to succeed in the industry. Industry. And this month we're focusing on the music industry. And so that event will take place on April 28th at six o'clock PM Eastern time. And when you sign up, you get assigned to meet with three different people for 30 minutes each. So, and then you rotate. Um, so 30 minutes, have a conversation, 30 minutes. And then we all come together as a group to share like kind of key takeaways. We have like some really great people. We have um, like the Grace Lee, who's the head of artist relations for YouTube. And we have um, award-winning composers and publishers and entertainment lawyers. Um, so it's a really great opportunity to ask questions and just to, like I said, to, to do some networking. Um, so you can register on our website, aaartsalliance.org. And then um, on April 13th, we also have a conversation with Christopher Ho and Daisy Nam, and they are editors of a new um, compilation called Best Letters from Asian Americans in the Arts. And they're gonna be talking about the genesis of this project, um, which is basically they commission letters from artists during the pandemic. So it's a very interesting reflection of a specific moment in time. And they will be um, joined by two of the contributing artists to that. So there's just a ton of things that we do um, to bring the community together to amplify the voices of creative, creative people. And it's just a great way to connect um, with the community. So I hope you will follow us on social media. We're at AA Arts Alliance and um, you can sign up for our newsletter, check out our website, like I said, aaartsalliance.org. And uh, we have a great uh, calendar that lists all sorts of events and opportunities where you can find out about grants and exhibitions and fellowships and jobs and things like that. So come check us out. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. That table dish sounds awesome. I'm definitely going to register for that. Um, but for everyone who's new and just joining, uh, my name is Mia and I'm the founder of Color Music Collective. We are all super, super excited for this panel. And we have such an incredible lineup of some really, really impressive, diverse music executives. Um, this week's panel is the challenges that face AAPIs working in the music industry. And we're partnering with A4, which is super exciting. Um, so with that, I'm going to have Marissa go into introductions of our panelists. 
Hi everyone, my name is Marissa and I am a member of the social media team over at 2MC. I am so happy to be co-moderating today with Mia. This is my first time moderating, so hopefully it won't be my last. Um, <laughs> with that being said, we're going to begin with introductions and then we'll be jumping into a handful of discussion questions. And towards the end, we will be having our Q&A session where you have the opportunity to ask a question live to any of the panelists that we have here today. Um, no pressure with the Q&A questions. There's no video, it's just audio. So feel comfortable to share your questions in the Q&A box that's on the below down at the screen. Um, so with that, we're gonna jump right into introductions. Let's have everyone go around and please share your name, your position, your company, um, your pronouns and some of your clients. Um, let's kick it off with Jason. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Jason, I'm VP of Artist Partnerships and Business Development at 88 Rising. Um, we're a record label that represents Asian artists. Um, before 88, I led business development at places like Google, Disney, um, and Deezer, which is a streaming service. And I'm currently based in, in, in uh, Miami. Awesome, and next we have Soy. Hi, my name is Soy, and I work in creator product marketing at Spotify, which is a part of our org that supports the future creator generation and Spotify for artists. Prior to that, um, I actually worked in the music industries in Korea, as well as the US in digital marketing and artist management. And yeah, I'm really excited to be here today with you all. Well, we're excited to have you. Um, next, we have Bowie. Hello, uh, my name is Bowie Chen. I am from Queens, New York. I work at United Talent Agency in the music touring division um, as a booking coordinator. And Serafina. Hi, everyone. I'm Serafina Latkomga. I am a senior creative manager of Sync at Pulse Music Group, which is an indie music publisher uh, located in Los Angeles. A few of our clients or artists on our roster includes Kay Trinata, James Blake from The Jewels, and a bunch more. Um, I've been in LA for about 13 years, possibly worked in music for about 10 years, spent a good chunk of it being a music blogger, and then I segue into the sync industry about uh, six years ago. Awesome. And last but not least, we have Amy. Hey, everyone. This is Ani. Um, I am happy to be here today. So I'm currently the B2B marketing director at Pandora. And I actually started my career in music uh, way back in the APAC region um, in promoting Chinese pop music in the greater China regions and then uh, expanding into uh, the other APAC countries, um, including Japan, Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, you name it, and basically bringing Chinese pop music into uh, Asian countries that speak a different language. And then uh, I moved to the Bay Area a while ago. <laughs> and um, I eventually found my way back into music now uh, at Pandora. And so different setting, different culture, and different set of challenges. And I look forward to sharing that with you guys today. Thank you all so, so much. Um, so we're just gonna jump right in. Um, our first question is, what is a misconception or stereotype about the AAPI community you wish that would stop? And feel free to just all chime in whenever. The model minority myth, right? We can all agree on that. Um, I guess I'll kick it off. Um, working in not just entertainment, but specifically the music industry, I, I find it so not appalling, but to be put on a pedestal, you know, as an incoming Asian American, you know, to be given opportunity that we are supposed to be, you know, so great in math, we're supposed to be so great in this and, and that. And, you know, I feel like it, if, if, if anyone other, any other panel panelists want to jump in because I feel like I'm going to go off the rail because I'm very passionate about that, um, please feel free. But I'll kick it off with that model minority myth. I agree, um, That is, yeah, I think with 
a lot of the things that have come to light this year, um, I think surprisingly, a lot of people are actually still learning about the model myth minority. And I feel like even a lot of our parents didn't even know about it as they were living it when you know they were um, you know, trying to survive. Um, but I think a, part, a big part of the model minority myth is um, that you know, the Asian community is still a little bit, you know, reserved and meek and, you know, they will not cause an uproar. But I think that um, lately, you know, a lot of the Asian community is really using their voices to amplify the important issues that need to be brought to light, um, you know, in the music industry, in the film industry, and in all industries, and, you know, it's politics, uh, your social life, um, a lot of that is coming to light. And I'm really glad to see that happen. Um, because I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, the model minority myth was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't created by, um, by us, even though it's about us. <laughs> I'd love to add on to that too. I'd say, um, before I dive into the one that I would like to get rid of, um, the model minority myth is also very problematic because it was created as a way to wedge different societies, right? Different communities and this greater like fabric of America against each other. And so I think it is really important to kind of understand where it originates and how it is used to alienate people of color from one another. And I think the misconception that I would wanna raise is that the API community is a monolith. Um, you know, like within the API community, there are so many different types of people, whether it is different nationalities of origin, um, different creeds, different gender identities, different generations, right? Depending on whether you're first gen, second gen, 1.5 gen, third gen, fourth gen, fifth gen a a API, you're going to have a very different experience in this country. And oftentimes I think the experience is really alienating when you feel like the conversation is only looking at one generation or one like journey of people. And I've also seen that kind of used um, against API people in the sense that you might be the only Asian in the room and suddenly you're expected to be the expert on all Asian cultures. And you're like, wait, like I, I love a lot of these cultures but I can't speak to any of them as an expert. So I think that's something that is really worth unpacking. Definitely some great points to touch on there that you all brought up about the model minority myth and how it is used to pit um, groups against one another. I think now more than ever, we can all say that it's really important to put aside whatever differences that um, has been put into these communities and kind of band together. Um, with that being said, we are going to move on to our next question, which is what can artists, labels and industry members do to empower AAPI artists? Feel free to chime in whenever you want. We can go for this one. Um, I think that, you know, with, with everything um, we're trying to highlight within the music industry, whether it's a certain genre or whether it's a certain, you know, uh, location that the artists are based from. I mean, even looking at, you know, Spotify playlists where you have, you know, these popular playlists that people follow just based on the genres. Um, I feel like, um, I feel like a lot of people um, don't realize that there are huge pockets of Asian artists out there that aren't just from Asia. Um, there are plenty here in the US and, you know, we've seen a lot of them come to light, you know, thanks to, you know, ADA Rising and, you know, much more organizations like that. But I feel like, um, the more we highlight, you know, API artists, the more that people can learn about it and see that we have a vast variety of artists that can do, you know, any genre, come from all over the place, have all sorts of different backgrounds, come from different generations, like we talked about before. Um, I think that, um, you know, a lot of people hear Asian music and they think of the K-pop that's popular right now that's coming from other countries. But I feel like, um, you know, we could definitely highlight our own here, you know, and start within our own communities. And, you know, hopefully that would bring um, a little bit more spotlight to the Asian uh, API artists. Thanks for the 88 shout out, Sarah <laughs> Um, I completely agree with what you're saying. And I think also just like being able to even remove the misconceptions of what does it mean to be an Asian artist. Um, you know, there's there's still like many, many calls that I may, may hop on and and I talk about um what we're trying to do at 88 Rising and and the immediate reaction from, from the person on the other side may say, oh, I love K-pop, um, which I think is, 
is, is fine, but also actually like, you know, most of our artists are actually not K-pop. And I think some people sometimes um, put, put those two together thinking that Asian artists are only K-pop. Um, and, you know, that's only just one genre in the industry and certainly K-pop has, has gone very far, but I would encourage, I think, really folks in the industry and even outside the industry to um, diversify their, their knowledge of what does it mean to be an Asian artist and also empower artists um, in K-pop, but also outside of K-pop um, so that all kind of artists can thrive. And we can also see artists from all different types of countries, you know, shine, whether it's in, you know, in, in Southeast Asia or um, South Asia and, and beyond. Um, I would like to add in that um, what the industry can do and also for artists here in the US is that we got to start highlighting the individuality of each culture, right, at the highest level, um, what is included. Um, the term K-pop itself, uh, it's a great question. What is included in K-pop? What is being excluded in K-pop? What are the different genres in Korean music that should be presented to the audience? And the industry really owes um, the audience, the listeners, um, an educational opportunity of how that the music genres are being presented. And then on top of that, um, I think the individuality really needs to be brought out, right? The way we're categorizing music, the way we're throwing names on, I, they call Chinese pop music C-pop. It's not even a genre, right? It's following what K-pop was. Uh, named after and then um, and down to each individual countries if you look at Japan which is a super diverse domestic market itself what are the different categories and they do respect that individualism too uh, if you go to well nowadays there aren't any more tower records uh, but if anyone's had a chance to go to a, a, a record store right how is music being categorized is it based, is it, is there a world music category? Is it an Asian music category? Uh, the same on, on all the platforms that we're utilizing today, right? So I think that's the best way in how we're educating the mass audience um, to, to better understand Asian culture. And then um, it starts with by introducing the actual labels, the real labels of what they are and not grouping them by categories. And I think that's, a, that's something that the industry kind of has this responsibility to look into and um, to bring that forth to listeners. Awesome, thank you all so much for answering. Um, our next question is, how was entering the music industry as an AAPI? Did you receive any pushback from any family or friends or maybe even the industry itself? I'm sure at least for my parents, like they didn't even know what the music business was. They were like, are you working for the artists? Like, like, what is it? So I'm sure maybe you guys have probably similar stories. I still get pushed back, even to this day. What do you do? Like, don't worry about it, you know? Um, but, you know, I think, I think as an API, you know, there are not many of us within the music community. So, you know, it's hard for our parents and, you know, extended family to understand how can you support something you don't understand, right? You know, I'm sure we have a lot of friends and buddies that work as accountants and doctors, and that's great. That's an incredible, you know, profession. But I think, you know, I think as an API, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that we face two battles. One is professionally where you're trying to fight your way through the ranks. And then one at home where you're like, you know, your parents may not understand. I'm a first generation myself, right? So, you know, what my parents grew up listening to it was different from what I grew up listening to, right? So I think there's two different battles and I think that's what makes us really tough as a community. Um, but the beautiful thing about everything going on right now, unfortunately, I think it's galvanizing us. Like we wouldn't all be on this call if it wasn't for all the nonsense going on, right? So that's what I've faced with personally. And hopefully, you know, whoever's on this call that's listening that has their mom or dad on their ass about, no, like go do what you should be doing. You know, if your heart's in music, if your heart's in entertainment, just just do it, right? Prove them wrong. Believe in yourself before they believe in you. I 100% agree with Bowie. Um, I definitely still get some pushback too. And yes, my parents still don't know what I do. Um, you know, they know I work in music, but that's all they can say. Um, uh, 
but yeah, it's, you know, I think it's coming from, at least in my personal experience, coming from Southeast Asian uh, community with uh, immigrant parents, you know, immigrant parents always want that financial stability for you. And so they only know the certain fields, you know, such as medicine and law and, you know, accounting and stuff like that, you know, where you will find it, you will find a job if you get the skills, right? But to go into something creative, where there is a passion feeling it, you know, that's not something they, they have experience with. So, you know, some may be hesitant to, you know, fully want to understand that, um, you know, anything music related. I remember when I was younger, even when I was in high school and I wanted to take a dance class, my mom found out I was enrolling for a dance class and she was like, oh no, that's a waste of time. You're going to enroll this engineering drafting class, which I did not use. I still found my way back to music. Uh, you know, it's, it's just funny, but, um, yeah, I think the creative field is a little, it's a little risky to some of our parents. So, um, I mean, that's what I've seen a lot, but I also think that, um, when they start to see more, you know, API community members, um, succeed, then they kind of start to believe it a little bit more. Um, and, you know, even growing up, if I see, I remember when I saw Suchin Pak on MTV news, you know, I was like, Oh, I, she's like me, this is possible. So, you know, I, I think that that's something we can kind of drive home to our family members, you know, is to say, hey, this person has done it. There's no reason why you won't be able to either. I had a very different experience. Um, and I think largely it's because I started my career back in Korea. Um, and so it was very interesting. And this is something I think about quite often where it literally took like going back to the country of origin for my family for me to see people who looked like me in my own industry when I was starting out, which is mind boggling. Um, but I do feel very grateful for that experience because that is how I learned. Like I still vi vividly remember, um, I visited Korea as a high school student and I was sitting in the movie theater watching a movie in Korean probably understanding 50% of it at the time. And something just felt very strange about the experience. And I was like, is it because it's the language? Is it because I'm not getting the story? And then it hit me. It's because it is the very first time in my life that I'm in a movie theater looking at people who look like me on a big screen. And it was just like, whoa, like I didn't know that was possible. And so in a way, I'm very, very thankful that I had, I was privileged to have that experience of starting my career out there um, to come back and be like, wait, there are very creative people who look like us. It's obviously possible, but then you come back to America and it is very like you're faced with a very different reality where you look around and suddenly like you are the Asian person in the room very often. And I would just like to add to this conversation that whatever pushback you may or may not be receiving, like everything begins with representation. And so if a reason for you not wanting to start in this industry is fear of not seeing people who look like you, well, there are people who look like you right on the screen. And so I hope that gets you to be like, wait, I should do it because you're really paying it forward for that future generation because representation starts with one person. And if you can get that one person in the room to multiply to two people, to three people, to four people, now you have a voice. And it's really important when we think about how it's it really just takes a child seeing one person that looks like them think about why black panther was such a big deal when it came out think about why when um shang chi comes out like that's going to be a huge deal it's really about seeing that person that can look like you and so i really would just love to encourage anyone who's like out there listening being like is it even worth it yeah if you want to do it it's worth it anything you want to do in your life is worth it I can share my story as well. Um, so I also started out my career in music outside of US in Taiwan. The background is kind of, that's Taipei 101, the building in Taipei, uh, a picture of my hometown. And um, when I first told my parents that I'll be joining Sony Music uh, doing marketing and they shared with their friends and then they came back and said, oh, so you're gonna be part of the entourage. Um, <laughs> as I moved into artist management and all that, um, they had no idea what I, did uh, in the music industry, but even today they still have no idea what I do in the advertising industry. Um, so it's not so much about um, what what the expectation is, but knowing what is going to allow you to learn and grow. I feel like you just got to take that leap of faith in knowing that uh, I'm pa there's passion there. You know that brings out the energy in you. And then on top of that, I think it's important. 
for those of you um, on this panel, you know, all of us to come out and join these panel sessions, right, and share our experiences because your success becomes a profile in which uh, young people can take back and share with their parents. You know, they could say, hey, show them Jason's LinkedIn profile and be like, I want to be just like him. You know, there is a career in the music industry and it can be just as successful, you know, um, or, or Bowie, you know, look at him, you know. So I think uh, like like Bowie had mentioned, if not for this, I, it would be hard for uh, a lot of people to um, step up and then to be participating in more conversations and all of that. And I want to point out how important it is because because the, there's no it, 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 there's no role models as many role models uh, for for the Asian uh, Americans um, youths right and so the the more people come out and share their experiences the more they have a profile to kind of reference I'm not saying to follow it but to reference in that oh that's a possibility or that's an option uh, I'm definitely uh, I guess I, I'm, I'm cross generations where I have kids now and I'm considering if I should sign them up for engineering courses um, <laughs> and uh, or dance classes, right? And I'm actually doing all of it because my goal is for them to try everything, right? And, and to figure out what they like. Uh, but I could definitely see that how um, being that middle generation, um, it's, it's trying to get the best out of both. Uh, generations and then um, and I think it, it's good right to have to to see all, all of you guys participating in, in, in these conversations and for folks who are joining you know to be seeking out and learning these experiences uh, from all these professionals in the space. Just to add to that well first I, I feel very inspired to be in this conversation I think this is probably one of the first panels that I've been on where um, most of everyone else is AAPI. So that in itself, I think, showcases how far we've come as an industry to have um, uh, folks that are Asian or Asian American and working in music. I think for me, um, to share a little bit about, about my story, um, I definitely did not see that when I first started in the industry over, over 10 years ago. Um, and in fact, after college, I went into probably a profession that is stereotypically Asian, which is on Wall Street. And I started in investment banking. Um, and I think what was interesting even in that category in finance at that time is there were, there were a good amount of folks that were API in my analyst class. But when I looked at the upper ranks of management, there was zero. And that actually made me question whether or not I would be able to succeed, given that the representation just did not happen at that top layer. Um, and fortunately, even when I was in Wall Street, I um, just just to share a funny story, the American Idol editions were in town. And I had this vision of, of wanting to become a global pop star. <laughs> so I told my manager at UBS on Wall Street and I said, the American Idol auditions are in town. And if I make it, I'm not gonna return the next day. <laughs> so I went to the auditions and um, unfortunately I went back to work the next day. I was rejected. <laughs> my heart was broken, but I left the American Idol auditions in the IZOD Center in New Jersey. And I said, you know what? One day I will make it in the music business. I'm just going to merge two of these things that I know that I'm good at, you know, the business side clearly because I was I was in Wall Street. And um, while I may not be the best singer, at least I can integrate that music side into the business. And that kind of was a path that I really continued on and I decided to to, to leave Wall Street to kind of move and maneuver into music and, and entertainment. So I think for, you know, for folks tuning in to this call, I feel that just even this type of panel, I don't think we could have done actually 10 to 15 years ago. Um, so if you have that inner voice and for you, that could be that, you know, that American Isle edition or whatever it is, I would say, you know, move towards it and chase it because that inner voice is telling you where your passion lies. Well, that was just incredible to hear all of your different stories. And I think it really brought home the fact that, you know, 
we are so diverse as a community and everyone has their own individual journey that has brought them to where they are now. I can definitely relate to all those stories because even as a student myself on a weekly basis, my parents still do ask me, you know, hey, Marissa, what are you actually studying at university? What are you actually doing in those internships that you say you're doing? And I think that seeing this representation on this panel and hearing about all of your individual stories and how you came to like accept this as a potential career for yourself has been incredibly encouraging, not only for me, but I'm sure for a lot of the attendees that we have here today. Um, with that being said, we are going to move on to our last question of the day, which is, how do you feel about the lack of AAPI presence in entertainment, media, and politics? And what do you think has to be done both within and outside of the community to improve this? Um, I think that one of the, the most important things that everyone, anyone can get involved with is mentorships. Um, to help with the representation, you know, um, doesn't matter, you know, what industry you're in, uh, you know, which community you're in, where you are, if there is, if you would like to, you know, help bring younger folks into an industry that they may have not ever thought of, you know, um, that is something huge. Um, I know that, you know, I grew up in Michigan and I didn't, growing up, I didn't really think that, you know, jobs like music supervisor, or, you know, uh, film and TV music was actually even a job. Um, and now it's a, it's a bit more prevalent because, you know, there's the internet, there's social media, things have changed. But um, I think that it's important to, you know, reach out for those mentorships, find mentees and whatnot, because I also feel like a lot of people um, also feel like, well, I didn't go down that path. I didn't go to music business school. Um, you know, it's a little too late for me. And I urge, you know, for everyone in our, our industry to kind of reach out to other, uh, to younger folks and tell them it's never too late. I mean, for me, like I said, I wasn't in music all my life, but I came back to it. You know, I was supposed to be an English high school teacher in the Chicago suburbs. That's what I thought I was going to do. Um, and now I'm in LA, you know, in the music industry and it just kind of felt right. I always, kind of inched back towards music. So um, I feel like there are kids and younger folks out there who have an interest, but maybe are scared to take that jump or think it's possible for them. And I think that with more, you know, scholarships, mentorship programs and, um, and programs similar like that, that can reach out to um, younger generations um, who aren't even thinking about this process or this possibility would make such a huge difference. I would love to add to that. Um, I think about it in three steps. I think it's learn, bridge, and educate. Um, learning is really important. And I say this in the, in like the most broadest of terms. The AAPI experience is not one you will learn in a traditional US classroom. Our history is something that is self-taught. It is still being written. It is still being unearthed. If you, you know, bring the average like US history classroom curriculum to the table, we're not mentioned anywhere. And so it's really important that I think as an AAPI individual, if you are especially going to be oftentimes the only person in the room in the beginning, you know, really speaking to some of these things that our community is going through, educate yourself. I'm still learning too. It's been a decade that I'm still learning. And I, it's just really empowering. And I say like, educate yourself, not in a disparaging way, but it is the most empowering thing to learn that, hey, like maybe I'm only one or two generations here, but people who look like me have lived in this country for over 300 years. And that is a power that once you like realize that that is part of your legacy, that opens doors because you're like, wait a minute, like we deserve a seat at this table. Why are we even trying to sit at this table? We should build our own table with people who look like us and build something that's more inclusive and build something that's even better. So I think the first step really is education. The second step I say is bridging because we can't do this alone. I think it's, you'd be really remiss to be like, hey, like we're AAPI, we're gonna go and like build a community by ourselves and be really happy together. We're seeing across the table because I think the question was not only media, but also in politics, right? And in entertainment and just across the board, 
all of these things are intertwined. They all come at a confluence. And so with that, it's really about intersectionality and building bridges with different communities. And that means once you've educated yourself on your own community's history, go and learn about all the different rich communities out there with which you interact every single day and with which you must build bridges if you want to go somewhere. And so I say this as like, as we talk about like the Stop Asian Hate Movement that's going on right now, which is really important, go and also learn about like, what have the people uh, in the black community, like what have they gone through? Like what has their experience been like? Like you need to be able to build that bridge because you're not going anywhere as a community on your own. And I think the third step then after that is educate. And that being once you've learned how, what it is for you to be API, once you've learned what it means to build bridges, then go and share that knowledge with people and like be on the grounds. There are a lot of people out there who are doing this as a full-time job being activists, but really these conversations just start in small instances when it's just you and a friend at a cafe and they like ask nonchalantly, hey, like, how are you doing? There are really like amazing opportunities in your day to day. And like, you don't have to be like at a pulpit behind like a microphone and do something great. It's really like sowing seeds everywhere, right? Because that's the only way that people will really learn and understand and come together and build together. So I think those are three like actionable ways to think about what can I do as one person in this giant sea of everything that's going on one voice is very important. And I think that's something that we can all do more of. I'd like to add something to that as well. I mean, the whole learning uh, yourself uh, part, um, you know, I think to see the bigger picture, sometimes you have to step back and see what has, why has, why has this community become like this? How did we get to be like this? Understanding our history a bit better um, definitely helps you see the bit, uh, the bigger picture for sure. Um, and then also, you know, um, amplify. I love what you said about amplifying our voices. It's not just going to be us. We have to find allies who will help amplify amplify our voices and our communities as well for sure. I love that you brought that up. All right, thank you all so so much. Um, so with that, we're gonna jump right into our Q&A portion, but we're actually gonna kick it off with Lisa. Um, she's gonna kick us off with our first Q&A question. Yeah, this was so wonderful. I really enjoyed hearing all of your perspectives. And I just, I wanted to ask like, um, like what, what is one piece of advice you wished you'd received as you know, a young person starting off in your career or what, what's, you know, you, you had already mentioned, a lot of you had mentioned some things, but I'm just kind of curious, like what would you, what would you say to your younger self? Um, it's something that I also read today, but then I, I fully uh, agree, is that whenever you, if, if there's one thing I can tell the younger self uh, of me is that I'm always enough to do something that I wanted to. So don't hesitate because you have what it takes. And some people might think that it's a cliche in like, oh, you're like giving yourself a pat in the back. But you know what? It, it really starts with that one notion of thinking that I have a chance at, at doing it and then believing in yourself. If you don't start from there, you, you don't stand a chance, right? Um, and so that's something that I would go back and tell myself, because I think each one of us go through the conflicting thoughts of, well, I'm not sure if I'm good enough. I'm not sure if I should speak up because I was kind of told not to talk when other people are talking. Um, I'm not sure if I should be joining. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm good enough to be representing. And it's always to tell yourself that, yes, you are, and you're good enough. That's one advice I would want to leave with the attendees today? Um, I would say you're not competing against anyone but yourself, right? Like you are in your own lane and that lane is up to you to go as fast or as slow as you'd like. Like you don't have to be like, wait, like there's all this 30 under 30, like, ah, like I'm supposed to be this like mega CEO by the time I'm 23 and I founded three different companies and like be on this magazine. No, like if that's, that's what you want to do, like, that's great too. Like we need people to do that too. But I would tell my younger self, like give yourself the time to be curious because you have your entire life to work. Like be curious, figure out what you want to try, try all the different things. Every experience kind of builds on the other and there is no too slow or too fast for you to go. 
All right. Well, these are very, very reassuring um, questions. I mean, sorry, responses, I'm sure, not just um, for me, but for everyone here. We are going to be bringing on our next um, question. So Alana, feel free to unmute and ask your question to our panelists. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Hi, I just want to say thank you so much to our amazing panelists. I really enjoyed this conversation so far. Um, and then my question is, do you have any tough lessons that you've learned as an AAPI in the music industry? Um, you know, I think you're always told to put your head down and work very, very, very hard. Um, but know your value. And there's a moment in time in your career where you need to stand up for yourself. And, you know, not, not saying throw a fit, but when enough is enough to stand up to your bully or whatever the case may be, know your value. You know, yes, put your head down and work hard, but know that there are moments where you do need to speak up for yourself. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much, Alana. Um, we have our next question, which I believe is Thea. So if you want to unmute yourself, uh, ask your question. Sure, hi everyone. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak on this panel with you all and ask a question. And thank you to all the panelists for taking the time out of your day um, to have this with us. Um, I just wanted to ask, especially if there aren't any Asian uh, C-level executives, what are some suggestions you might have for someone to bring about an AAPI initiative to the company that they work in? Happy to jump in on this. Um, I, you know, I think, there's there's still like this weight, of course, with all the recent events that have occurred and, and cum, culminating into into Atlanta. So we've gone to a place where there, there was a mass shooting of APIs. Um, and at that same level, I think with with where we are now, I think Thea, you should feel empowered to to share your story or share your voice. Um, cause I think if, if there was never a better time, it, it's, it, it's now. Um, and if you want to start an initiative coming from your, you know, the API perspective, or you want to share something, um, to, to your team on building a new group or, or, or doing something to volunteer for the API community, I think now is a time where people will listen. And I also think people, you know, we, we want this to also, of course, continue into the future, um, but now is the time for for change in those um, difficult um, conversations. I think so far, you know, um, what I've also kind of seen from my peers in the industry, and I've just never seen this before. Like, gr I mean, growing up, being born and raised in in New York, and being Asian American my whole life, I've never seen a corporate company come out and say something about us or our community. And just seeing, yes, they may just be tiles on Instagram, but even seeing like Peloton or Pinterest, Nike, like say that they're going to stand up, you know, for what's happening right now, I will say is inspiring. It's the first step. Um, and it sounds like the other that maybe your company has not done that before, or there's no Asian representation, but um, I think you should feel pow empowered to elevate your voice, have those conversations, because like your voice really matters, I think, in terms of what you want to be done and I think it could have this ripple effects. All right well thank you so much Thea for your question and thank you Jason for that awesome answer. Okay next we will be having Abigail ask our next question so Abigail if you'd like to unmute yourself and come onto the stage and ask our panelists Hi everyone uh, my name is Abigail and I just want to thank you guys uh, for coming it's very inspiring to see like people like myself um, in this industry and on this panel. Um, so I, I work in uh, K-pop tours. So I've been really interested to see kind of the East and West uh, collaborating, especially in the recent years. Um, so we've seen a lot of crossovers with Eastern music moving into the Western market and um, is especially gaining momentum uh, more quickly. Uh, just wanted to know what other areas do you see or would like to see the East and West collaborate uh, within music and entertainment or beyond? Could be any personal projects or uh, things that you're doing work? I guess I can take this one since I work in music touring. 
but it's a, it's a tough question to answer now because you know COVID, no one's traveling. <laughs> um, you know, every everyone's quarantined at the moment. If you're flying from east to west or vice versa, um, but I mean, look, I would love to see more, and, and we see it right now with um, uh, BTS. And sorry, Mr. Stop, he's around the block. If you guys hear, um, but yeah, BTS is doing great. I think you know they're. Their management, they're breaking away from like the JYPs and the YGs of the world. So they are bringing K-pop to the forefront of, um, of, of the States, which is great, but I'd love to personally see more of the C-pop and J-pop do that. And I think it starts with um, management. And I think that starts with giving opportunities to APIs like ourselves to make these decisions, to take a, to, to take a risk, you know, with us in the States. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my opinion on that. I also think um, that when, when it comes, you know, we hear a lot about East-West um, crossovers or, and, and collaborations, but I think often when it comes from the artists themselves, it's when it's most authentic and it's, it's something that they're excited about. Um, one, one example I could share is on, on the 88 side, um, we recently signed Chung Ha, who's already one of the top K-pop female solo artists. And for her new record, she really wanted to lean in to um, her, her interest in Latin American culture. Um, and um, just, I think just, just that side is, is, is super interesting. Um, and we kind of wanted to also kind of explore those sounds. So those sounds are replicated in the record. And we also um, uh, had Chunga collaborate with um, Guana, who's one of the top Puerto Rican rappers. And in this record um, um, that she just released a couple weeks ago, um, there's a track called Demente. And um, not only does she collaborate with Guana, but she sings the song completely in Spanish. <laughs> and she's like the first like K-pop singer to do that. And it sounds really good. Um, a lot of people don't know that she actually lived in Texas for eight years. Um, so she just has all these like, like um, mind boggling, like genre um, um, kind of collaborations and in, in her mind in terms of like what music collaboration she, she wants to do. Um, so that's one example I think of just kind of doing something that comes starting from the artist's perspective, but also being able to collaborate with other cultures in ways that we have not done before. And, it's, and I think that the reaction even from the audience has been really inspiring. Like when we look at the track, we're seeing it trend and Argentina and Peru and all these countries where they certainly did not know about Chang'e before, but now it's, she's being introduced to a new audience, but it's not coming from a place where like 88 Rising, we're forcing her to do it. It's actually coming from herself and it's been really exciting to see. I'd love to add on to that. Um, I think there are two things I'd love to see more of. One, I was thinking about very recently um, in the film space, just the power of the film Minari and how you're seeing this like combination of fully Asian American actors and actresses with an Asian American director, an Asian American writer, right? Like all these folks, as well as the inclusion of like a Korean actress or actually two of them, right? Um, who identify as like Korean from Korea. And it's just very cool to see this combination of voices coming together of people who are AAPI and people who are Asian coming together to kind of parse out just what that actually means, like what is the API experience and just that film was so powerful in so many ways. But I also think like beyond that, what we're seeing with that film, also the way that, you know, Bowie, you mentioned BTS, but also the way that BTS is seen in America, for instance. Um, I think we have a long way to go as an industry to be like, how do we celebrate Asian art and API art without tokenizing it? or without demanding that people who wish to share their art with the world, um, specifically the US have to speak in English in order to do that. Like how do we honor um, the, when art comes over from the East that it's allowed to be, you know, presented in their native tongue, in their native language, in the way that's honest and real to them without having it be forced through this American gaze to be acceptable here. Um, that is something that I would really love to see more of in the future. And to add to that too, right? You're so right because that film, in terms of tokenization, it's about the American dream. It's taking place in Arkansas, like, but it was awarded. I think the nomination was what a foreign film. 
It didn't count as an American film. Right. That blows my mind, our mind. So it's like, and and that wouldn't be the case if the board um, who makes these, you know, nominations, if there was you or me sitting at that table, having that discussion, and they're like, wait a minute, like, one of us would speak up, but we don't have representation, which is so crucial. That is that is the problem. But, but like, you know, we are inching. We got the nom. We're moving, you know? And this is why we need everyone listening to follow their dream and work in this industry. We need more of us. Thank you so much for answering my question. Thank you so much, Abigail. Um, so with that, that's going to conclude our wonderful panel tonight. Um, I know we had a lot of other questions that were asked, so I definitely encourage you to reach out to our panelists tonight on LinkedIn or whatever platform you prefer to continue the conversation. But thank you all so much for a wonderful panelists. I know this conversation was um, really difficult, so I really appreciate you guys being so vulnerable and offering so much really great advice. And thank you so much for Lisa and A4 for partnering with us for tonight. Um, so have a great rest of your evening. I definitely encourage you guys to follow us on all of our social media to find out the details for our next panel if you guys are new here. But have a great rest of your evening and um, week if I don't see you. But have a great night, everybody.